Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you. My name is Steve Weitzman, and in my role as director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, I um, am delighted for you to join us for today's uh, program, This is Students Philanthropy, the Interaction of Politics, Business, and Charity. Today's program is actually part of a larger series co-organized uh, by myself and Professor Lila, Lila Corwin-Berman at Temple University. Um, and the series is focused on the study of Jewish philanthropy, the past, present, and future of Jewish philanthropy. And I want to begin by thanking Professor uh, Corwin Bourbon for um, her partnership uh, and her leadership of the Feinstein Center for American Jewish History at Temple University, um, which is the co-convener of the series. I also want to thank the Lipman Camphor Foundation for Living Torah and the Middle East Center at the University of Pennsylvania for their co-sponsorship as well. Before I introduce our distinguished guests uh, this afternoon, just a word or two about the format. Um, this program will last for an hour. And after the presentation part of the program, there will be a chance for you to ask questions via our Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. So um, at any point during the program, you can submit a question via the Q&A function, and I will be drawing on those questions um, and presenting them to Professor Sassoon when we get to that part of the program. Let me also just put in a quick plug for the last program in the series on Jewish philanthropy for this year. Um, it is a program entitled Covering Jewish Philanthropy, the role of the press, and it will uh, consist of a panel of journalists um, who've covered uh, and, and done uh, reporting and research on contemporary Jewish philanthropy. So we're very excited about that program, which will be on March 15th, also at noon uh, via Zoom. So you can go to the CAT Center website uh, to register for more information. So with that, it is now my pleasure um, to introduce our um, speaker this afternoon, Professor Joseph Sassoon, um, who is Professor and El Sabah Chair in Politics and Political Economy of the Arab World at Georgetown University. Professor Sassoon has established himself as one of the nation's preeminent scholars of the political economy of the Arab world today. Um, and his research includes economic history, especially focused on Iraq. Um, and the topics that he's addressed through his scholarship include the nature of authoritarianism um, and the displacement of Iraqi refugees. Um, but today's program uh, has a somewhat different focus. Um, it is connected to his very recently published book uh, on the Sassoon family, a magnificent history, which has garnered much acclaim and attention. Um, and um, we are delighted that he's going to be sharing some of his research um, in a presentation that's going to focus on the intersection of philanthropy, business, and politics in the history of the Sassoon family. So without further ado, Professor Sassoon, welcome to our virtual stage. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for the Katz Center and Temple University for uh, hosting me. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, so this is soon a Baghdadi Jewish trading family built a global trading enterprise by taking advantage of major historical developments during the 19th century. Their story is not just one of an Arab Jewish family that settled in India, traded in China, and aspired to be British. It also presents an extraordinary vista into the world in which they lived and prospered economically, politically, and socially. The 150-year globalization of which they were a part was all-encompassing. They traded with members of every religion and sect around the globe. They traveled extensively, not only for business, but for to explore new countries. And they felt home wherever they settled, whether in India or China, and in spite of being a tiny minority everywhere, both in terms of religion and being foreigners in India, China, and Japan. The book is not only about the Sassoon's rise, but also about their decline, why it happened, how political and economic changes after the First World War adversely affected them, and finally, how realizing their aspirations to reach the upper echelons of the British society 
led to their disengagement from business and prevented them from adapting to the new economic and political world order. I think it is important, given our topic today, to situate the founder David and his attachment to Judaism in order to understand his philanthropic philosophy. According to a rabbi who visited Baghdad in 1824, there were about 6,000 Jewish families and five large synagogues in Baghdad. A later traveler estimated 7,000 out of a total population of 50,000 and noted the prominent role Jews played in the province. Jews typically were with Armenians and Persians, the major merchants and bankers of the Islamic territories. The most important of these was not only in their home provinces, but also in the Ottoman Empire, capital of the Ottoman Empire. One, Ezekiel Gabay, an important Baghdadi banker, was even appointed the chief treasurer at the court in Constantinople where he became one of Sultan Mahmoud II's favorite advisor as a reward for helping the Sultan deal with a troublesome Pasha in 1811. In Baghdad, Sheikh Sassoon, David's father, was appointed by the Sultan also as chief treasurer of the province of Baghdad in 1781. By 1826, after disagreement with the governor of Baghdad, Daoud Pasha, and the threat to his oldest son, David, Sheikh Sassoon specially chartered a boat to take David to Basra, where, on his father's advice, he did not linger but continued on to Bushir, about 400 miles southeast on the coast of Iran. The father joined later, but he died in Bushir, and so David took his family to Bombay and thus began of the story of the rise of the Sassoon dynasty. The family seems to have kept every scrap of paper. Their archives stretch for more than 100 years and they engaged in copious correspondence both for business and for social matters. Almost all business correspondence, at least until 1920, was written in the Baghdadi Jewish dialect, um, which was the language at the time, but it, later on, it became really a coded language that prevented outsiders from reading their letters. Um, let me just show you, this is a typical one of thousands and thousands of these documents at the National Library in Jerusalem. And uh, you could see it, it starts always with very formal, but moves on to the business criticism and, and other aspects. Um, when David arrived in Bombay in the early 1830s, its inhabitants numbered no more than 200, but were very diverse, Hindus, Muslims, Parsis, Armenians, Portuguese, and Jews. There was a Jewish connection with Bombay from the 16th century as one of the eminent Portuguese traders residing in Bombay was a Jew, but there was no community until the second half of the 18th century when immigration flows started arriving from different parts of the world. David was by nature risk averse and studied every possible difficulty. Family was of immense importance to him. His first wife died young in Baghdad after bearing him two sons and two daughters. His second wife, who outlived him, gave birth to six sons and four daughters. The sons were trained in business from a young age and later were sent off to Baghdad and the Gulf ports to meet other traders and gain experience, and most importantly, learn the Arabic language in order to keep this language alive and be able to correspond. David realized that the fate and success of his family had to be tied to the British Empire, hence began a long connection serving British colonial economic and political interests in the different locations to which the Sassoons branched out. Wherever David went, he was attuned to local customs and traditions. As soon as the family arrived in Bombay, he began learning the Hindustani language, adding it to his fluency in Arabic, Hebrew, Turkish, and Persian. Remarkably, and in spite of his decision from the early stages of his career, 
to tie his family's destiny with the British Empire and its interest, he never learned English. Although he never set foot in Britain, he was granted British citizenship in 1853, and he had to sign the oath in Hebrew. His cosmopolitan nature and ability to deal with people from all cultures and religions did not dent his strong adherence to Jewish traditions and ritual. Among his close friends in Bombay was John Wilson, a Scottish Christian missionary who was also an Orientalist scholar and educator. One of Wilson's many books is a treatise about the Parsi religion, and he later founded the Wilson College in Bombay, still there. Um, it seems that he and David met already in the early 1830s and became firm friends. Often they spent their evenings together studying the Old Testament in the original through the medium of Hindustani eked out by snatches of Arabic. Indeed, David was profoundly attached to Judaism and was uncompromisingly observant of Jewish law and practice. He was a devoted student of the Talmud and insisted that all his sons had a thorough education, Jewish education. Though his sons were described as pious and learned, the reality that after their father's death, only one or two of his sons continued in his path of learning and researching Jewish writings. A few years before his death, David built a synagogue in the neighborhood where he resided. This is actually two synagogues he built, one in Bombay, the blue one, which is a functioning synagogue, beautiful. And the other one is in Pune, which is about four hours drive from Bombay and has a little bit better weather than Bombay, less humid. And that's where he spent his last few years. And again, this amazing synagogue still there. And he's actually buried uh, outside in, in, in the garden. Um, David attended these synagogues regularly and sometimes participated in public worship on Mondays and Thursdays, where tradition prescribed the reading of a lesson from the five books of the Torah. All the offices and branches of the Sassoons were closed every Saturday, as well as Sunday, which was the other day of rest for the local and foreign merchants in Bombay. Most Saturday afternoons, heads of the Jewish community gathered at David's house to discuss biblical texts, listen to a visiting scholar, or study together difficult Jewish texts. In the 1850s, this group of friends and scholars were organized as Chivrat Bet David, the Brotherhood of the House of David, a model taken from old Baghdad where a group of men banded together and formed a club to discuss things, but also to support each other. What was important for merchant families who were expanding globally was not just the religious beliefs of anyone, but what they really cared about more was can they trust their counterparts, given that they were trading from far and rarely met or spoke to other traders or agents. Hence, the emblems of the family, this emblem was put together after David's death by his older uh, son. As you can see, the crest symbolizes the importance of trust, emetve imuna, and in, in, in Latin, candide constante. And also, you could see some of the family's roots in the emblem, you know, the palm tree, to remind them of their home. Let me move now to the specific of the topic of philanthropy. Philanthropy was and is based on three dimensions. One, real belief in certain projects that are close to the heart of the donor. Two, service to their own community, be it religious or ethnic. And a third, but a critical dimension is what I would term the political economy of philanthropy. What are the benefits that would accrue the donor economically and more crucially politically with the authorities? These benefits are not necessarily immediate, and sometimes the donors might be able to anticipate the reactions of the public and ruling group, but in many cases, it might be a long time before the donors rate the benefits. 
the founder of the Sassoon dynasty, David Sassoon's commitment to charity and helping others stemmed directly from his religious upbringing and beliefs. An important tenet by which he lived and that was followed by his successors was the importance of charitable donation to social causes in the countries in which they settled. So in the archives, this is kind of very quick, you know, they had the cash books or trade books of uh, most years. And one of the fascinating aspect, which was really truly innovative, they taxed every trade that they did with a tax called tzedaka or mitzvah, which was a quarter of 1% for each transaction, irrelevant of whether the trade was profitable or not. You see those highlighted in yellow, each one at the end. So you see, for example, a chest of tea, the cost, the cost of transport, maritime insurance, other costs, and then at the end, that tax of quarter of 1%. It might not seem a lot, but if you're doing hundreds and hundreds, these are huge books um, of one year, you accumulate a, a large amount towards the end of the year that are given um, to charity. The scope of David's charity ranged from building a synagogue, which I showed you, or two, to setting up a school and creating a think tank where public lectures were given. He was deeply committed to improving the welfare of his fellow men, be they members of the Jewish community or residents of Bombay. This is some of the things that he did. Needless to say, this philanthropy was not without benefits. As well as the prestige such projects brought, a school he set up for boys to study both secular and religious topics also functioned as a pool from which educated, talented young men could be recruited to the firm. Some would go on to work with, for other companies or to start their own, but this connection with the Sassoon and its benefactor would never be forgotten. A similar school was set up for girls and a third known as the David Sassoon Industrial and Reformatory Institution for underprivileged juveniles including ex-prisoners to learn a trade such as carpentry or metalwork. Although David Sassoon sought to close the school on Saturdays and Sundays, the government of Bombay denied the request as it would manifestly dis be disadvantages to the inmates of the institution as well as unfavorable to this discipline. The board of each institution consisted of one or two of his sons together with the three British men living in India and at least one or two Indians from the mercantile circle. By the 1850s, David Charitable Benefactor had expanded. He contributed to a famine fund to help the widows and orphans of the Indian Rebellion of 1857, to a sailor's home in Hong Kong and Bombay that provided shelter for merchant seamen. A few years before his death, he set up the Sassoon Hospital in Pune, which still exists in his name, that treated patients irrespective of their nationality or religion. And in Shanghai, he purchased land for a Jewish cemetery. Another facet of David's philanthropy was aimed at Britain and its officials and expressed his unwavering commitment to the empire and its colonial interests. In 1850, when he became more recognized in Bombay, he contributed to a large tablet ornament that was presented to Captain John Dalimpel for his contribution to commerce in China during the Opium War. David and his two sons were also among the subscriber to the Agri Horticultural Society of Western India and he donated to the general improvements of the Victoria Gardens in Bombay. By the late 1850s and early 1860s, David was frequently mentioned in British correspondence for his munificence and his contribution 
to the welfare of Bombay and for his support to British causes in different parts of the empire. It is notable how relatively quickly he immersed himself in public affairs once he became a successful merchant. His name was mentioned in Bombay Almanac from 1853 as one of six Jew merchants in the city. And in 1855, he was listed as one quote of Her Majesty's justices resident in Bombay, qualified to act as justices for the town of Bombay and islands of Bombay and Calaba. His sons followed in his footsteps and contributed to a wide range of charities, but also continued with the policy to boost the family's relationship with the British establishment. His oldest son, Abdullah, who was knighted in 1872 and became known as Sir Albert, wanted to strengthen the family's relationship with the royal family in Britain, given that many members of the family have moved to London by the late 19th century. One of Albert's first overtures to the royal family was also one of his grandest. When Albert, the Prince of Wales, visited India in 1875 as part of an extensive tour of the empire, his Sassoon namesake remained in London but ensured that Lady Sassoon would entertain the prince at their grand home in Bombay, which was called Son Souci, and meet other members of the family. After the prince returned to London, Sir Albert obtained his permission to erect a statue of him in Bombay to commemorate his visit. A few months after the sculptor John Edgar Bohm began work on the colossal statue at a cost of 10,000 pounds, today that's about a million sterling, which is roughly say a million and a half dollars. Queen Victoria herself inspected it. Two years later at a party hosted by Mr. and Mrs. Ruben Sassoon at their home in London, the prince accompanied by his daughter viewed the finished statue, a bronze figure on a horseback mounted on a granite pedestal together stretching 27 feet into the air before it was shipped to Bombay. In June 1879, the statue was unveiled in Bombay by the governor, Sir Richard Temple. Officials, merchants, and residents gathered in heavy rain to view it. I put it on the left how it was and how it is today, um, the, the, uh, which is still in the center of Bombay, but without the statue of the Prince of Wales, just the horse. Um, and this is really in the heart of, of Bombay. There is no doubt that India was far closer to the hearts of the Sassoons than China, and we could see that clearly in their philanthropy. No major institution was created in Shanghai, but donations were given frequently to help flood or famine victims. Members of the family built a couple of synagogues for the community in Shanghai and Hong Kong and other places, but there were no major educational or health institution, the same which I described in India. A large library, which I showed you before that opened in Bombay became really the first think tank in Bombay um, with 10,000 books and 5,000 periodicals at the time. And by the way, it's still called the Sassoon Library today. And um, every resident of Bombay know it as a major institution. Um, most of, without exception until recently, members of the family acted as trustees on the library board. Within a few years, the Institute became the equivalent, as I said, of a modern think tank. And by 1875, it had about 350 members. And apart from technical courses offered during the day, it provided a forum for lectures and discussions during the evenings. As the Sassoons became anglicized by the third generations, far less donations were made by the Sassoons to religious causes 
but more to British institutions such as a museum, the Royal Air Force, sports facilities, particularly horse racing, but school and hospital were still high on the agenda. The Sassoon, after all, declared at a very early stage that they identified totally and utterly with the British. Not only that, but once they moved to England and the Anglicization process began, they did everything possible to ingratiate themselves with the colonial powers. Um, even early on, you could see that they developed relationship not just with the royal family, but people like William Gladstone, who became prime minister by donating to charities that his wife was heading. No doubt they succeeded in becoming English and being accepted by the majority of the aristocracy um, in spite of all the prejudices that prevailed at the end of the 19th century. One interesting aspect of this philanthropy policy, they did not support political causes in the name of the family's firm, neither in India, nor in England, nor anywhere. The Sassoon's, for example, was not interested in or supporters of Zionism. And although they gave some donations to charities in Palestine, these were mostly for religious purposes or for supporting a particular rabbi who had requested their help. Chaim Weizmann actually did not think highly of one of the Sassoon's, Philip Sassoon, a member of the cabinet and remarked, quote, the only man to ignore the whole business of Palestine was Philip Sassoon, another of Lloyd George secretaries, and as it happens, the only Jewish member of the British delegation." End of quote. So how can this work help us to understand more about Jewish philanthropy? In looking at their philanthropy in India, I realize it's important to compare with large successful families such as the Tatas who were Parsis uh, living in Bombay. I think it would be interesting to explore how these families borrowed ideas from each other. It's almost impossible to envisage a situation that they did not discuss ideas for philanthropy. After all, these two families, the Sassoons and Tatas knew each other. They were partners in many projects. They were in the business of cotton and opium. They sat on the boards of the same banks. And you could see that, for example, when David Sassoon set up uh, the school for girls, at the same time, one of the Tatas does another school for girls. There was also a certain affinities with the Parsis on many levels, not least of which that they were both a small minority as in a sea of other ethnic and religious groups. Furthermore, um, they were, as I said, they were partners in all different uh, uh, projects. There is um, no trace of these conversations taking place in the archives, but one has to assume that it took place. Another element that needs to be examined is the conflict that arose between community and city. What to give to the community versus what to give the city. And the Sassoons were criticized sometimes for not giving more to the small Baghdadi community or the Jewish community or later to Palestine, but were generous in donating to big projects for the city of Bombay. An additional factor that needs to be looked at the uh, when played a role is obviously taxes and death duties. For most of the 20th century in England, the state taxes ranged from 40 to 60%. Unlike the United States, there were no deductions for charities. When one, the son of uh, Albert, Edward Sassoon died in 1912, he was the first to refuse to leave money to charity. In his will, he declared, and I quote, I desire to state that I have made no bequests for charitable purposes. First, because I give and intend to give during my life according to my means. And secondly, as a protest against what is 
in my view, the impolitical and prohibitive legacy duty prescribed by law on charitable agencies. Any impost that tends to discourage charitable bequests, especially in a country like Great Britain, where healing agencies altogether depend on voluntary contribution, must, in my humble opinion, be radically unsound." End of quote. 50 years later, another Sassoon, Hannah Gabay, was furious that her donation to the National Trust, which is obviously a very major organization, of 300,000 pounds was not tax exempt. And we're talking about really very large sums. A final, final thought and consideration that served as a motivator for philanthropists is social control. Funds were not merely given to uplift, but to produce a satisfactory set of outcomes among the poor and others. The Sassoons adopted this method when they set up in Bombay a school for delinquent youths and trained them in technical matters. The Kaduris in Hong Kong, interestingly enough, turned this method as the corn to become the cornerstone of their philanthropy, past and present. Schools for peasants to train in farming and technical schools for the poor in Hong Kong and China. And they refused to put money in people's pocket, but opted rather to finance projects that would provide employment and income. So to conclude, philanthropy was a cornerstone for many global merchants in the 19th century and served religious, social, political, and economic aspirations of these families. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sassoon. That is such a rich history. Um, so I want to remind the audience that you have the option of submitting questions through the Q&A function. Um, but while you're thinking about that, let me begin with one of my own, which is um, this, the, the philanthropic behavior that you described. Was this, did your research show that, that there was characteristic of, of non-Jewish families in the same level of economic and social status, or is that specific to... Well, um, I I think that others like the Tatas and others, other merchant families gave, but it really similar like today, if a firm or a family had a good year, they gave money. I think what was really unique about the Sassoon is what I showed in their trading books, this self-imposed tax of quarter of 1% for its taka was truly innovative, because what it meant, even if you have a bad year, um, you still have accumulated enough money for charity. And that I have not come across in, in other families. Interesting. So one uh, pair of questions we have from an audience member, Daniel, is asking about, um, first of all, the relationship of the Sassoons to Benjamin Disraeli, another prominent Jewish leader at that time, and also their relationship to the Rothschild family, the Rothschild family. Well, I mean, they really kind uh, worked on all those politicians, um, you know, by, by trying to ingratiate themselves, whether, as I said, charities to Gladstone wife, and then the relationship begins, and suddenly it becomes a little bit more social. Um, and the same thing they did really throughout the period with all of the senior uh, uh, politicians. With the Rothschilds, the big change takes place when Albert's son, Edward, marries into the Rothschild. And that augurs the beginning of um, marriages with European families. Uh, the Rothschild was just one such example, there were uh, the Polyakovs, the Gunzburg, um, the Trieste, indifferent. These were aristocratic European Jewish families, and obviously that opened the door for the Sassoon to expand and establish themselves um, more in Europe rather than you know, in, in India. Um, an interesting element of that connection is actually also political. 
So the son of Albert uh, Edward marries into the Rothschild, but within 10, 12 years, um, her father, who used to be a member of parliament, kind passes it to him. I mean, still had to go through elections, but given the area that they were living and their prominence and their control of so many aspects of that province ensured that his son-in-law, Edward, becomes a member of parliament. And, and he stayed in, in, in the parliament. The downside of all this, of course, it took them away from running the business. And you know, in the book, I describe this demise in detail and, and how it took place. Hmm. Another question uh, sort of about the history of the family. Did David Sassoon um, himself actively seek British, British citizenship, um, even though it appears he would never went to England, or uh, kind of was he made a citizen as a kind of a way for the government to co-opt his participation in its imperial projects? It's really the latter. And one of the things that I found very fascinating, at some point, it seems that anyone who worked for the Sassoon was entitled to a, a, a British passport. Um, this creates a big issue for some members who were given, who started working with the Sassoon. They were not Sassoon me family members. Uh, they spun off and sometimes they became super, super rich. Um, and we know about it because the British now wants to tax them for inheritance but they were never in England and they never visited. They, some of them didn't speak English. Um, but it was fascinating that um, anyone who worked for the Sassoon received that uh, uh, passport. I assume it was another way of recruiting young people from Baghdad. Um, and here is how philanthropy was also used in the sense of when you're recruiting in Baghdad, you know, the fact that there were school for boys, girls, uh, there was a hospital, there was even a cemetery. So kind, you're providing all these packages to these young recruits um, in order to bring them because the pool of talent was really limited to Baghdad because of that correspondence and the language that they used, um, which, was a great benefit to them when they were corresponding. But as the firm grew and expanded, um, the fact that the pool of talent was really limited uh, worked against them. Interesting. Um, so you mentioned in passing a couple of times, and I think it appeared in the letter that you showed on screen that the Sassoon's family, the, the role of the family in the opium trade. And I'm wondering if uh, one of the audience members wants to learn a little bit more about that. What what role do they play in the opium trade? Is that Was that the primary source of their income? Um, it was one of the sources. Um, it definitely played a role, and, and I talk a lot about it and write it about uh, in the book quite a lot and in detail. Um, but one of the things we need to understand is you really can't look at it from the perspective of 2023 you have to look at it from the perspective of the mid 19th century. And the facts are the following. One, opium became a, a, a legal commodity and an official commodity to trade from 1840. Um, if you look at the financial newspapers, uh, whether in America, Britain, uh, China, uh, Hong Kong, you will see that uh, opium was traded as a commodity no different from silver or gold. Um, opium constituted 16% of the total revenues of India, was the most valuable commodity for uh, 25 years. But one other important aspect we need to keep in mind, until 1907, opium was legal everywhere. You could walk to any pharmacy in New York or Paris or London and tell the pharmacist that you have a headache or a stomach bug. And most likely the pharmacist will uh, 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 give you 
opium. Um, the, the last point about it, and this is none of this is to try to defend it, but just to put it in the right perspective. Um, in 1895, um, because of Christian religious pressure on the British uh, Parliament to ban the trade, uh, the British part of the government set up a major commission of inquiry that took five years and produced uh, 2,500 pages, um, which is a remarkable source for researchers on the opium in the 19th century. And they interviewed a huge number of scientists and, 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 and doctors. And their conclusion was shocking. Um, the conclusion was really very simple and straightforward. All this talk about opium is exaggerated. If you're going to ban opium, then you need to ban alcohol altogether because it's, it depends on the quantity you're taking. And I cannot tell you how the British Parliament reacted when they heard there is a whiff of banning whiskey um, because they were told, you know, one glass of whiskey is not going to hurt you, but half a bottle, yes. So the same applies to opium. I, I'm just putting this all because I, I think we need to understand it in that perspective. But overall, it, it was a commodity, a major commodity like cotton and opium, which really these are the two commodities that made Bombay and its merchants successful in uh, the second half of the 19th century. So another question is, is, is asking if you could just fill in kind of, a, is the family still in business? What exactly is the status of the family today? Do they still do business together? Um, are they, is the Sassoon family writ large still engaged in charitable giving? Can you just fill in a little bit the uh, the answer, unfortunately, to all those questions is no, no, no. Uh, they, the family business split into two competing businesses after the death of the founder, David Sassoon. And for the next 100 years, there were two firms, one called David Sassoon & Co., which was run by the oldest son, Abdullah, and then his uh, uh, children. Um, the other one uh, was created by the second son who refused the will of the father to appoint the oldest son as the chairman and created a competing firm called E.D. Sassoon. David Sassoon kind really um, disappeared more or less by uh, the 1920s. It was uh, became more or less insignificant definitely by the 1930s. One of the chapters of the book talk about the most important and last really capable leader of the firm, which was a woman who was the only CEO of a global trading firm at the end of 19th century. She was truly a remarkable person. Um, running the business in an innovative way, in a complicated way, but also as a person later on with her knowledge of Judaism and the Talmud, and she moved from Bombay to London, but her departure, or more correctly, the men of the family pushing her out, really augured the beginning of the end of that side of the farm. The other side of the firm, E.D. Sassoon, continued to prosper with the arrival of another important personality, who is Victor Sassoon. He moved the business from India to China in the 1920s. By then, commodity trading all died, and the focus was real estate, real estate, real estate. And he built the first skyscraper, and he built other institutions in China. But of course, what he did not foresee is all the invasion, 1937, the Japanese invasion, and of course, after Pearl Harbor. Um, and when the war ended, um, there was no, you know, Shanghai was in terrible state. And then a civil war began between the nationalists and the communists. 
and he misread the leaves and and um, kind of lost everything. In 1949, uh, the Chinese government nationalized 19 buildings but that belonged to Sun. One of them you could still see in the main street in Shanghai on the Bund. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. It's now used as a hotel, a five-star hotel. Mm. But there is no business and there is no family business. Um, I asked this question, not to get too personal, but just because I know the audience will be curious about this. How do you fit into the family tree of the... Uh... So the origin, the founder, David Sassoon, he fled because of a fear from a corrupt governor that was harassing the father, not because of religion, but he was harassing and embezzling money from different merchant families. Uh, the father was worried about his eldest son, so he arranged for him to flee Baghdad. He joined him, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, David's siblings stayed in Baghdad, behind in Baghdad. I'm the descendant of one of the siblings. Hmm. And did uh, and did he support the, the Jews that stayed behind in Baghdad? What was the relationship, his relationship to the Jews? Say that again. I didn't hear the first part. Um, what was David's relationship to the, the the Jews that remained in Baghdad? Did he also support them? Uh, the, it continued. They didn't need to support. They were continuing to prosper throughout the whole period. I mean, there was interest in them. We see sometimes when there was again a governor, a bad governor, at the end of the nineteenth century or early twentieth century. There was. Um, immediately they would run to the British government to put some pressure. Uh, they definitely gave Staka, for example, during Pesach, we see correspondence about uh, uh, shipping uh, matzot and other items. Um, but the family, irrelevant. I mean, the Jewish community continued to prosper at the time after their departure. Yeah, interesting. So the next question actually comes from a uh, graduate student who is doing research of their own on the Sassoon family and wants to know about um, the relationship to the Parsi community in Calcutta and in India, I guess. Um, the relationship was very, Bombay. very yeah, Bombay and and other yeah, the relationship was very, very strong, as I mentioned. Um that you know relationship was a lot of it based on business, uh, the work on philanthropy, but also what I did say, the fact that they were really two very small communities in this huge country with different uh, uh, religion and sects, um, they were really like half a percent, a quarter of a percent of 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 the size of the population there, so there was definitely that connection on all levels it's interesting all these friendships um you never see um any intermarriage uh it's purely business philanthropy and friendship um w w without taking it to 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 further than that um I mean, even today, there is a Parsi community. Um, some of the places that the Sassoons owned, uh, today they are owned by Parsis. Um, you know, while there is no real Jewish community as such, in a large sense, the Parsi community continued uh, uh, to flourish, but still a very, very small, even smaller percentage now as of the total of India. We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to keep going for a few more minutes, if that's okay with you. Sure, sure. Um, so another um, person wants to better understand how they settled on a quarter of 1% as the right rate um, of kind of their self-taxation system that they... Yeah, interesting. I never found out, to be honest. I also, when I really, how did they get to that number and whether there was any... Um, kind significance, I couldn't. I guess it's a simple round number that you can calculate in your head as a quarter percent. That's the only thing I could think of. Hmm. Whether there was any religious meaning to that number of two, five, I cannot tell you. 
Um, and I haven't found anything in the in the archives about how did they get that number. Hmm. Another question has to do with the family's relationship to Zionism and Jewish nationalism and why that doesn't wasn't a philanthropic focus. Um, do you have any thoughts about why that was the case? Yeah, was I mean, I think two things. One, in the beginning, I think they really felt that they need to focus on where they're living and where they're working or where they have uh, workers off in the family business. Otherwise, it's open-ended and they don't want to just give money uh, uh, to any cause. Second, I am assuming, and again, the archives is not very clear about that, but I am assuming from one or two correspondents that once that move to England begins, um, they feel that first the place of the Jews, whether it's in Baghdad or in India or in Britain, these are uh, uh, fine homes for them. Um, there is really no connection to any other uh, a place or any other movement. Um, and I think their Britishness dictated a lot to show that they want to be part and parcel of that and not uh, to have a Jewish home somewhere else. Um, none of them lived in Israel, I'm, I'm not talking about the, you know, some did move in only in like 1960s or 70s, but that's after the business is gone and was purely a, a personal decision of one member here or there. Um, but it is important to understand, and I think they were very uh, uh, strict about it from that point of view. Mm. You touched on this a little bit um, in reference to China, but since they, the Sassoon family was so uh, instrumental in British colonialism, I mean, did they suffer any backlash from uh, from that involvement in the colonialist project? I mean, is there any, I mean, what is their reputation in India? Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question. I mean, you know, there is a Jewish museum in Shanghai, I think, in the last 15 years, the Chinese government has done a lot to uh, uh, kind highlight all those uh, connections of Jews to the city. Uh, one important aspect is when Victor Sassoon was in, in Shanghai, we have to remember that Shanghai was the only and only city in the whole world that was open to Jews. Um, you did not need a visa. So all those people escaping from Germany, Austria, other places, the one place that they knew if they can get to um, is Shanghai. And once they got there, they would be taken. And Victor Sassoon gave a lot and donated a lot of money to support, I think, what at the time arrived 30,000, 40,000. And in a way, those 30, 40,000 really owe their lives to the city and, and, and to the Chinese. I think that the issue of opium is still there. Um, and I went there to give some talks before COVID in 2019. That issue comes up. Um, but it's really more anger at the colonial policy of Britain rather than on the Sassoons because the opium trade began really 200 years before uh, David Sassoon left Iraq. And, and when David Sassoon uh, uh, left Baghdad and went to India, the first 15 years, he was such a small merchant. Uh, I, I think the first opium uh, uh, chest that he traded was sometime in the early 1840, there were major British companies, Indian merchants who were trading it. That issue comes up, but it, it I don't think it, they're, they're still seen as an important part of, of the history of Shanghai. There is a beautiful small um, Sassoon exhibition inside that hotel, uh, obviously sponsored by, by the government. 
So let me sneak in one last kind of two-part question. Um, the book has really resonated for a lot of people. It's a very successful book. And I'm wondering um, if you have any insights into why it's resonating today for, for so many people. Um, and the second part is, in your, you know, speaking about the book, have you made any connections to other descendants of the Sassoon family and um, have any reflections on, on their stories since, you know, in the contemporary period? Yeah, I mean, I think the first reason is really you do not read on many families coming from the East or whatever you call it um, about success and about becoming so global and so dominant and so influential um, in different parts of the world. So in a way, their story is really unique. There are other families, but the issue is the lack of archives. You can try to write about what is really special here is the fact that we have access to tens and tens of thousands of their correspondence. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the fun part of doing these talks in person or virtual is coming up through different Sassoons uh, literally everywhere. I uh, connected to a Sassoon in Perth, Australia, in the U.S., in Britain, um, in, in India. I mean, so it is really, uh, I never knew those people Um so that's one of the nice things of these talks. Yeah. And someone just asked, uh, and this, I believe this is true, but Vidal Sassoon is part of this family as well. Is that correct? Categorically, no. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Categorically, no. Uh, Vidal Sassoon is a uh, family is from Aleppo, um, has nothing to do with it. We have to remember that the name Sassoon, Sasson, is a Hebrew word that means happiness, uh, Sasson Vesimcha. Uh, so, but um, there are a lot of Sassoons, but no, he's absolutely not connected. And the poets? The poet is definitely connected, Siegfried Sassoon, and it's a, quite a lot about him in the book because he really represents that fourth generation that was totally disconnected from Judaism and its uh, Baghdad roots. Mm. It's such a fascinating topic, Professor Sasson. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much. With us. Thank you and for all the questions. My pleasure. And people can see the book in the, in the background. And uh, if this were in person, we would do a book signing. But uh, in the in the COVID era, we're not quite back there yet. So I look forward to doing that someday. But thank you again so much. And thank you very so much. much to everyone for joining us. And don't forget our next program on March 15th uh, in the philanthropy series. We'll be focused on uh, covering the Jew on Jewish philanthropy in the press. So thank you all and have a good afternoon. Thank you.